Hello everyone, welcome. Um, I'm Simon Walker and this is Nick's Har Nick Harris. So welcome. We're just getting set up here ready for um, our next session. So thank you for joining us. Hello everybody. Um, a couple of <sighs> yeah, oh, that, what, that's what exactly what I was going to say. Does your audio work? Yes, it does. Excellent. <laughs> And um, I recognize a couple of names from people that have attended our previous sessions. So welcome back. We're just going to test up a couple of things. Firstly, can you hear and see us? There's a text box for questions inside the webinar interface. So if you can hear and see us, please say hello. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Jonas. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Jesus. Thanks, Jay, Marius, Steve, Jonas. Excellent. It all works. Awesome. Yes. That's that's a good start. And the the other thing to say is that we are recording this session. You'll probably see the recording icon at the bottom of the webinar interface. So you automatically get this recording uh, by email at the end of the session. Um, and as will any of your colleagues who have registered but can't attend, they also get the link to the recording. And in fact, that could bring I could bring up this document. This this is an intro. This PDF lists out all the fun stuff that we're going to get into in the session. But um, hello from Warsaw. <laughs> Hi there. Great. We got we got people from all over the world joining us. So officially, formally, I'm Simon Walker. I'm director of training at Maxon and at Red Giant, and we have. Um, recently merged together, so the, the, all the tools in Red Giant and all the tools that Cinema, uh, that Maxon make, like Cinema 4D and Redshift, are all available through us now. And so we're running these sessions really as an extension of the uh, the volume program training that we do anyway, and that we've done for years with Red Giant. And so it's a flavour of the complementary sessions that are available to your team if you have a series of licences, either Red Giant or Maxon. And how, and we like to run these sessions to show you how the tools work and also how you can integrate them. And that integration is really the key part of the sessions this week. And what I was going to say is that the document I've got on my screen now, this PDF document, is inside the webinar interface as a downloadable PDF. It's in the handout section. And so if you wanted to join the sessions tomorrow and or Thursday, then please click on the links inside the document and then you'll be able to register for them, even if you can't join them because you'll still get the recording. Or if you want to watch any of the previous recordings like this morning's one, please um, click on that link and then it'll say register, but actually you can go through and at just when it says register, just click OK and you get the recording immediately. It's just the word on the webinar interface. Great, and we'll run for an hour today and if you've got any follow-up questions or if you want to set up um, a session for your team using one of our expert trainers of which Nick is one actually he does a lot of training sessions for us and I'll introduce him properly in a second in fact here's his bio so <laughs> what I was going to say at the bottom of the document is a link to the email address which then allows you to ask follow-up questions so it's my name simon at redgiant.com so it's whatever questions you've got, either for Cinema or Redshift or any of the Red Giant tools. And also some information about Nick, our expert guest trainer here today. I've known Nick for a while now, and I'm consistently impressed by how much he reveals he knows about topics. And he's a master trainer for Avid and Adobe and Apple. And he's also very handy at Cinema and integrating all the Red Giant tools as well. So we're delighted to welcome him. So. Thank you for joining us, Nick, and thanks for sharing your expertise. Yes, it's great to be here today. <laughs> for a second session today, absolutely. Yes, exactly. Um, second time is a charm. Well, the first one was a charm too, but the second <laughs> one's the second charm. Yeah. Too right. Twice the charm. So yes. what we'll do, we'll we'll run through for about 45 or 50 minutes or so of content, and I'll try not to interrupt you, Nick, too much. Okay. But if you've got any questions that you would like to ask as we're going through, or if Nick highlights any topic that you'd like to know a bit more about, just type those in the questions box and we'll do our best to answer them as we go on. Or I may interrupt Nick if it's something that's relevant for the point he's making, but please let us know. Great, just checking to see if we've got any questions before we start off. No, that's all great. Everyone's saying that they can see and hear everything. So let's hand awesome. over. So I will share my screen with you. Here we go. Change presenter. Hand it over to you, Nick. 
Okay, just waiting for that dialog box to pop up here in a second. Yes, and there it is. I'm going to show my screen. And just to check before I begin and kind of dive into After Effects, I want to make sure that everyone can see my screen. Can everyone see and hear me okay? Looking good to me, Nick. Excellent. Um, amazing. Um, thanks, Jesus. Thanks, Pedro. Thanks, Mustafa. Yep, we're all good to go. So I will mute myself and turn off my webcam for the time being. And over to you, Nick. Great. Thanks so much, Simon. Um, and it's just great to be here today. Uh, wanna, I'll, I'll shave the full introduction to later because I really want to hop into some really kind of interesting and beginner workflows uh, between Cinema 4D and After Effects, looking at ways that we can utilize uh, sending data and information over and then having it be referenced by a major a, a lot of Red Giant tools with a focus on the trap code suite today. And as we go forward on Wednesday and Thursday, I'll be showing additional workflows and we'll get more intermediate and advanced as we go along. So let's let's start off with uh, an example I have here. And this is the end result, but to explain it, it's actually a light following along a path that I brought in from Cinema 4D into After Effects, and I'm having it reference, uh, I'm using a, 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 an effect called Trapcode DAO. I find DAO to be often overlooked in comparison to Trapcode Particular and Form, which are your flagship plugins within the Trapcode suite. But this has some amazing features uh, in the ability to create 3D geometry very quickly and simply. And there's so many options there that I want to kind of dive into this first. And from there, we'll look at a couple other light examples uh, using Maxon Cinema 4D and hop into uh, taking pieces of the content browser and content you can get for free and having it referenced by trap code form. So without further ado, let's go through this first example here and how I roughly ended up with this end result. So I'm going to hop over into Cinema, and I'll create a new project. Let's make sure that I can see my interface. Here we go. One thing that I think Cinema 4D is great for is your ability to quickly animate lights along spline paths. And there's a variety of ways that you can do this rather simply without really if you don't want to, diving into the full Cinema 4D features that are available to you. So I'm here in R21, and the first thing I'm going to do is actually uh, select a spline called a helix. You can see here that it's just added to my scene, and if I rotate around this scene using my three key, you can get a, a sense for that helix spline. The interesting thing about it, unless I attach it to something, this doesn't render. So if I press Command R right now in the scene, we wouldn't be actually able to see this helix. So with this helix selected, I'm just going to make a few changes. One in particular is going to deal with the actual angle set to 720 degrees. And by increasing that quite a bit more, I'll get more loops happening here. I'll also increase where the start angle happens and let's also play with the end angle as well along with the end radius so you can see that it's eventually becoming a lot smaller here at the bottom so my end result here is i want to have a light follow along this spline and this is rather easy and simple to set up so i'll click on this button to create a simple point light and the one thing I want to do with this light is to right click it, choose animation tags, and add this element here called align to spline. You'll see a tag is added to the light. And down here where I see its settings, the ability to have it um, reference a spline path. This can be anything that is a spline, even text, which makes this quite interesting in terms of animation techniques and bringing it into the Red Giant suite of products. I'm going to grab the Helix spline and add it to the spline path. And you'll see immediately my light is now at the start of this path. There's a property in the Align to Spline tag called Position. And if I just simply scrub it, notice that it animates from the beginning of the spline to the end. 
Now, before I animate this, I'm going to set this project to be 200 frames. And I'm going to also extend it out in its length. So let's add a keyframe by clicking on the little circle here under position and then drag all the way to the end, making this 100% in terms of its position data on the spline, and then click to add a record keyframe. If I press the play button, you'll notice this is now going around that helix, and all this information can be read uh, throughout a variety of trap code effects, which just makes this awesome, and just a really simple way of creating paths with lights that can be utilized inside of, uh, again, the trap code suite. So I wanted to mention something. There's there's two ways that we can bring this into After Effects. Uh, let me get, first of all, rid of this title. It's called Untitled 3. Not such a great name. I'll call it Helix. And just to make sure that we're referencing the right one on my desktop, I'll call it Path. So it's in a folder called Paths. Now, before you export, and read this Cinema 4D file, it's always good to check your render settings here at the top to see what the preset is set to. When you first start a project, it's going to be 1280 by 720. You may, however, want to come here and to a preset under Film and Video. Let's choose the HDTV 1080 2997 preset. So if I now save the file it will overwrite and be a 1920 by 1080 preset. So two ways to bring in this file. Um, way number one is to kind of bring in the Cinema 4D file using Cineware. So that is just importing the file inside. And way number two is actually from the render settings under save here. Notice that you can save an AEC file. So if I clicked on the save button here, uh, since there is no nothing inside the project that I really want to reference besides the light, just going here to save and choosing the target application and making sure my output is set to take all of the frames in my project. If I click on the Save Project File button, it will create an AEC file. As long as 3D data is included, it will register that light. The advantage of doing it this way is that the light and its movement will be identified inside of After Effects. So there's nothing else that we have to do. It's going to see that the light is moving. The other way, which I'm going to show you, actually, you have to do something in order for it to see the light's movement. And that is you need to bake the actual animation uh, because of Cineware right now. The way to do this, uh, because it's being attached to a helix using the align the spline tag, if I head over here to the animate workspace with align to spline selected, going to functions, there's this option to bake objects which would break, bake the fact that this uh, position data is attached to the line to spline. And doing this just adds just a bunch of keyframes, which After Effects will reference through Cineware. So now that that's done, I just want to identify that there's actually two lights in the project. One, which is the baked animation, and here's the original. Let me close Cinema. Inside of After Effects, I'm double clicking in the project panel. We'll head to that folder where I saved that project that was under the path folder. There's my Helix Cinema 4D file. So this is way number one, again, using Cineware. Just bring in that Cinema 4D file. Let's uh, create a composition based on this. I'll just drag this here onto the new comp button. And I can see that the animation is occurring, at least visually. But in order for me to have access to those lights, I need to come to the bottom of the Cineware plugin under Effect Controls and choose Extract. Once I do, I should see that I have a light. Um, maybe I didn't save my project. Hold on, let me go back to Cineware. I think I might have not saved the Cineware project after I made the change here to the light copy. So let me. Let me do that, just make sure that that's saved. And let's just see, yes, now I get my light copy when I extract it. Awesome, trainer error. Okay, so here with that duplicate copy of the light, you can see there that I've got the keyframes. This is fantastic, again, data. And if I wanna see the way the scene looked for any reason, 
of, of how its final result would look, you'll have a tag here under uh, the renderer where you can choose to display the final render of your project. Okay, so this is the light that I'm interested in. I'll get rid of this other copy. And the first thing I'm gonna do is actually press uh, Command Y and I'll add a version of Trapcode DAO by heading to the effect menu. Here's my solid. Let's head down to the trap code category and choose DAO. Okay, I gotta make a little change here. And that is just because of the Cinema 4D camera where this 3D generated item is showing up. But I don't know if you guys can see this. What DAO does by default is it generates a 3D geometry along a path. And this happens to be, if we take a look, I'll just rotate this a bit, a circular shape that it's generating 3D geometry on. By default, you have the example of um, having it generate on a line as well as a fractal. Now, I'm not interested in this. I want it to actually follow my light here. So I'm gonna do the following. I'm gonna click off generate path. And here, this light, I'm gonna rename it. So for DAO to see it, I gotta call it the light DAO. And all of a sudden something kind of funky happens, which is all of this geometry is being, is stuck to the line. It's not moving, but it is stuck to the geometry, the path of the light. And that's because if I head down from the path generator section to the paths from tau lights, you'll see that this is automatically checked. Okay. Now let's clean this up a bit. Uh, in order to do that, I'll head to the segment section. And the first thing I'm gonna do is really play with the size of this geometry being generated. So let's make that 15. You can see that's a lot smaller. The next thing I'll do is increase the segments to make all of those segments a lot smoother. You can see how they are now a lot smoother along this path. I'll actually decrease the size just a little bit more as well to 10, that seems a little bit better. And I'm liking the start of these segments. By the way, you have different segments you can choose from. So right now it's set to extrude and gone, but you can choose from repeat and gone, which will give you a different pattern. And my favorite, which is repeat sphere. So you can see spheres here repeated along that path. And I can also increase the sides of the sphere to make this more spherical indeed. You can start to make out here that each of these are little circles along the path. And if I decrease the segments, we can see the spacing between those spheres. Cool. Now, the default light mode in DAO is set to entire path. In order to have it animate, I'm gonna choose build up. And we should start to see that if I move to the beginning, this 3D geometry really quickly animate along that light path from Cinema 4D. This is one of the biggest advantages of Trapco DAO is the speed that you can kind of create this 3D geometry along a path and reference lights. There are a lot of other things that we can do to this as well. In fact, I'm gonna close out the segment section here and let's play with some of the materials and the lighting. I can change the default color. I can play around with these default lighting setups. And while this light is being used to generate a path, I can also include this light to illuminate my scene. And you'll see that that moving light right now is indeed also illuminating my scene, uh, which makes for quite an interesting backlit animation, as you can see here. We could, of course, include uh, lights that are named Lumi to also illuminate our spheres that are being born across this light path. Looking at the material and lighting further, there's also this image-based lighting section, and DAO includes a bunch of HDR images uh, in this category that you could choose from. These are just presets. Notice here, I've added a sunset field. You've got a green forest. 
there's also options inside of here to pick your own HDR image in order to have it reflect across this 3D geometry to make some really interesting animations, not to mention have some reflections across that 3D geometry working incredibly fast inside of After Effects. Cool. So let's continue with a, a few more things. I, I would say that there's so many powerful sections in here, but if one were to stand out, it would be the fact that we can take this light and this path that we've created and repeat it. The way to do this uh, would go to the be to go to the first repeater section, and I'm going to add one rep repetition of this, and you'll see I actually get two. I'll just up the quality so you guys can see this a bit better, but there's now two replications of that light path. If I wanted to, I could just increase the distance between these. And the reason that there's two when this number is one is because of this R1 symmetric doubler enabled. If I disable this by clicking on it, you'll see that that third copy or second copy disappears. I could, of course, increase the repetitions. And things start to get really powerful when uh, you decide to rotate this geometry. So I'm just rotating this on the X and the Y space ever so slightly to create different formulations of this path, all animating around that geometry from a Cinema 4D light. Cool. So it's using similar techniques like this. Uh, in fact, let me go to the light example end that I ended up with this end result here. So you can see the extruded geometry, the repeated patterns. And if I look, one of the big differences inside this project is that there are two Tau lights, Dow lights being referenced. Hence why you're seeing two uh, rotated spherical um, paths being created here. There's something else going on. So if I look at my Dow layer, I look under textures, it's referencing a solid inside my composition called texturizer. So let me just solo this so you can see these back items. Uh, and in fact, for you guys to see this, it's always a good idea for me to turn off under my comps, the proxy file that's currently enabled. Uh, so let's go light example and there we go. Okay, so I've got the texturize and the spectralysis background. Both of these come from Red Giant Universe. It's an incredible plugin, and, and one of my favorite effects within it is this universe texturize effect. What it is, is it gives you access to a bunch of grunge textures. In fact, if you ever add this effect uh, from the universe stylized category, once you apply it to a solid or a layer of your choice, you can choose a preset, and you'll notice uh, all of these grunge based presets that are available to you. So here's a concrete bricks, you'll see it changes. And this is blending into a background of, of Spectralicious, which is another plugin under the generate category that creates these kind of cool multi gradient backgrounds available to you very, very quickly. Okay, so I'm going to back up on the steps here. So I've got this texturized background mixing with the Spectralicious here. And hold on, let me just again turn off the proxy file. Okay, so you can see that. And this is also being referenced by Trapco DAO. So if I go inside and look at the texture, it's referencing that solid. So indeed, if I changed the texture being referenced, the texture pattern would change on this geometry. And again, super quickly to create some really interesting abstract results, all with one light from Cinema 4D with an animated path. Show another example here too using Trapcode Particular. Uh, this is in fact the same Helix light. Uh, the difference is that it's been duplicated and repositioned inside the an After Effects composition. So notice I have six lights all named emitter one through six. 
each of those lights are attached to a null object, which allowed me to reposition these lights because I baked that position data keyframes. So I wanted to move them and not affect these keyframes. And so that's how I did it with the null object. And here at the top, I've got a, a version of particular. And particular, if you look at the emitter section, you'll see that it's referencing those lights. So any light in particular named emitter. I can change this name, but this is what it does by default. So what's interesting about this, in fact, let me just turn off the background here for a second and disable my proxy file. So what's interesting about this, if I solo this, are a few things when you want particular to sort of wrap around a light animation. Um, and that is all has to do with the base emitter settings. This particular setup has two systems at work, but I'm gonna to go to my master system and show you that under emitter, what you wanna focus on is the velocity as well as the emitter size here. So I brought down all of these velocity values pretty much to zero so that we see a really tightly knit group of particles along this line. Uh, if this velocity is too strong, these items or those particles are going to expand from the line, kind of giving you a little bit too much craziness in terms of not forming that light path. So that combined with changing the emitter size to zero creates this like tightly lit uh, series of particles being born across this traveling light animation. The other thing that was done besides the emitter section and, and changing it to lights is under uh, particles, changing the type to streaklet creates a lovely little streak of particles. You can see there that the size is relatively small at a value of 20 with some randomness. And there happens to be an additional two particle sources at play here. One is, which I love about particular, is the ability of, I'm just going to turn off the system two here so you guys can see this a bit clearer, is the ability to have particles born from other particles. So we have a, a main group of particles being born, slightly affected by some gravity. And then we have a secondary set of particles, which is referred to as an aux system. Right now, the probability of this particle system, which is being born from these original particles, is set to 50%. So there's a 50% chance that they will be born uh, from a main particle. They have a less of a lifespan, but you'll see here that they're sort of wisping around with this light animation. So the overall theme here is that taking or really easily creating light paths inside of Cinema 4D, uh, you can have these animations interpreted in all the different parts of trap code suite. Everyone still with me, Simon? I'm just I'm just double checking to make sure I'm not having a, a full-on conversation with myself. We're, it's all it's all coming through loud and clear. <laughs> Uh, one awesome. one question that um, one question that came up that's probably good to share now is about um, the the speed of the processing because um, the it may not be apparent but all of Dow and all of Mir are processing on the GPU and you can also set up trap, um, particular and form to process on the GPU as well so that's that's why you're able to rotate all those different shapes around and that's why you're able to get a good responsiveness out of after effects because of the extra gpu processing even if you've got an eGPU setup so just to show you here in the rendering setup the two different accelerations these are also available uh, in the designer too just to add to what you were saying simon uh, which if you're just starting out with particular you got to note that there are just some incredible uh, presets inside of here. If you go inside, so you could start off with the single system presets over here at the side and look at all of these available uh, particle simulations that are available to you. Some of them are actually referencing OBJ objects, another thing that you can bring from Cinema 4D uh, inside of the Trapcode suite in particular that we'll cover in a second, but just a great 
bunch of places that you can start here, either using single system presets or multiple system presets, which get even more complex. And they are just incredible starting places. And not to mention the fact that if I select one of these, the response that I get inside of the designer as a tool to start my particle simulations and creations is fantastic. It is an incredible way of sort of designing your initial particle look where you can then grab or then bring into After Effects for some final uh, touches, so to speak. Notice how I'm also using the C key to move around here in the designer, uh, taking a look at this particle preset. Cool. Okay. Um, so enough of lights. Let's let's take an example and look at bringing in uh, something from the content browser inside of Cinema 4D to be referenced by a trap code mirror and form. So I want to show you guys the end result first. Uh, here we have an amplifier. This is if you have Cinema 4D R21 and probably even an earlier version, you have access to download um, a ton of free content and some of this content, the models that are included, can be exported as an OBJ and then referenced by particular, form, and even trap code mirror, which we're going to get into. And just take a look here at this amplifier. And also note that part of this particle system is adapting to the music that's inside my composition. Okay, so now we've seen this. Let me hop inside of Cinema 4D. Whilst you're doing that, Nick, we've had a question from Larry about the coordinates yeah. sizing equate between uh, Cinema and After Effects. So it, it might be a, a, a good opportunity to mention that little um, but a couple of checkboxes inside Trap Code that allow you to ask for resizing and, re and flipping the Z axis. Oh, yes. Um, are, so in terms of uh, the actual coordinates in a form based system, so once you Great question. So let's just say that uh, in reference to, this is in reference to an OBJ, correct, Simon? That's that's right. And also just how the coordinates are sizing equate between Cinema and After Effects, as well as the the positions and coordinates between the different Red Giant tools. Um, so I could I could say that there are a few different ways to interpret OBJ settings based on your world in terms of in, um, inverting z space as well as the fact that the sizing controls of your obj are controlled here inside of trap code form and i'll also mention I, I'm, if i'm not understanding this question but let's just talk about camera coordinates there are after effects calculates its camera system in a completely different way sorry it's the center of its world in a completely different way than cinema 4d so um, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong on this, Simon, but Cinema 4D has its world coordinates at the center to be referenced at 000. zero, zero. That's right, default. yes. While After yep. Effects, um, its world center is based on coordinates, which are, let's just say if it's a 1920 by 1080 comp, your world center is 960 by 540 by zero. If it was 4K or Ultra HD, uh, you'd be looking at half of 3840 by 2160, which is, oh my gosh, I'm just drawing a blank, which is 1920 by 1080. <laughs> so your world centered is slightly different. Uh, there are multiple ways using null objects to sort of, as well as parenting relations to sort of get these two worlds on track. But there's there's something to note about those camera and making sure the positions carry over. Do you Do you have something to add to that too as well, Simon? Sorry, the mute. mute. <laughs> um, the, there's another th um, thing about the the invert Z button you got there inside the OBJ settings in terms of the quite often when you export something from Cinema, the invert Z um, setting inside Cinema is automatically engaged. So if you find yes. something is flipped around in the 180 degrees, that's why that button is there. 
Yes, and I'll, I'll uh, make sure to point this out when I export an OBJ to a wave front from um, Cinema for the person interested in this question, so you can see that that actual button uh, when you're exporting that file. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hop over to Cinema, and let me go back to my standard layout. What I want to do is in this blank untitled for project is take a look at the Cinema 4D content browser. So I want to mention that this doesn't, when you download Cinema 4D R20 or R21, this doesn't come with it by default. What you do have is if I, I'll just show you here, if I go to my help menu and I check for updates, if you don't have this in your content browser, all of this free material, this is a supplementary download. And this should appear. In the Maxon online updater, there's a tab for optional content. And from that, you should see these presets, which you can download. Quite a few gigabytes worth of content, but totally worth it. Uh, this is where you'd see the optional tab. Totally worth uh, you being able to use it. You can see here from my history that I downloaded a bunch of these separate content libraries um, and the dates that I did did or previously did. So this supplementary material can be super helpful and useful uh, for starting off various scenes in Cinema 4D, and there's tons of content for all different types of disciplines. So let's look uh, at some of this content. Inside my presets, there's a collection called 3D Objects Volume 2, and inside that collection is a subcategory here for music. What I did was I grabbed this amplifier, and this is what I had referenced by trap code form. So to get there, I'm going to double click this file. In a few seconds, we should see that this file is going to load up inside of Cinema 4D. Let me head over here to objects and we can see that amplifier. I'm going to use a handy shortcut key with this selected called H just to frame this uh, directly to the window. So simply pressing the H key with it selected. And I can see that amplifier nice and big using the three key to rotate around the scene. So let's just say as is that I wanted to bring this into trap code because there's no animation. Simply heading to the file menu and choosing export wave from OBJ is perfect. If this has animation, you need to note something. And that is that you'll have to download um, a plugin in order to export out an OBJ sequence. One plugin is from a company called the Robite, if I'm correct, Simon. Uh, on AE Scripts, they have something called Sequence Exporter. You can see it here in the list. But this would allow you to export out an OBJ sequence. The great thing about it is, yeah, I've been I using the. Free. Sorry, Nick. Just to confirm, okay. I've been using the, the the Robite one. I just posted a link in the notes for it. Yeah, and I, I believe it's free too. So another great yeah. bonus. That, so you just have to have it installed in the right place in Cinema 4D. So if I want to export this full model, keep in mind, here's my wavefront OBJ, and this would be the way to do it. But I also want to mention that, let's just say that you want a piece of the model, and maybe that piece is, are these um, speakers that I'm turning on and off, or even an individual element in this speaker null group. You can select that item, and from the file menu here, where we're viewing each of those elements, I can export a selected object as a wavefront OBJ. So that's exactly what I did. Export it as an OBJ, and just so that I don't forget, let's see those options uh, from that menu that pops up. Notice the optional option here for flip Z access. That's what you were referring to, right, Simon? Automatically checked? That's the one, yep. Yeah. So just notice if it, uh, that is the one that's automatically selected and what it does indeed export. So I already have this exported and I have a project in After Effects ready for this. So let me head over into uh, the beginning form project. What I'm gonna do is create a solid and I'll call this mirror. We're gonna actually start with trap code mirror because it has a really kind of cool function we should take a look at. And from the effect menu, let's head into trap code and select mirror. By default, this is a 
a great effect for landscapes. And in fact, you can see the base geometry here is in fact a 3D plane. If you're wondering why it looks kind of strange of where it's positioned, is that I have a camera that is um, being animated by an orbit null here in 3D space. If I just change my viewports, you should be able to see with the camera selected that animation happening because of the null. Okay. So in the latest version of Mir comes your ability to switch your base geometry from a plane uh, to an OBJ model. Once you do, what you have to do is choose that OBJ model and Mir ships with a ton of presets. So you have all of this available to you to access, not to mention a few uh, ones from Pixel Lab objects here, which are pretty cool uh, to start off with. If you're looking to bring in your own OBJ from Cinema 4D, you're going to add a new project inside of an object from inside of Mir and then navigate to where you saved it. So here's my amplifier. You can see the Wavefront OBJ file. If I choose open, uh, that is what is currently being referenced in Mir right now, that amplifier. If I take this and I choose it and press OK, within a few seconds, we should see that Mir is now generating that OBJ model. And of course, all of my animation is taking place. Now I know that my final result, by the way, I've done a slight position change to move each of the 3D objects closer to the camera, but I want you to pay attention that its position is at world center, 960 by 540, but I'm gonna position it 300 pixels forward in Z space, okay? The really cool thing about bringing in an OBJ this way uh, with Mir, if you're looking for an abstract uh, building of 3D models, is that the same coordinate system that's here is also in trap code form and is also in particular. And this could be really useful if you're trying to position things in that trap code 3D space. So just notice that same position value and also notice its size currently set to 500. I'll, I'll change this to 700 to make it a little bit bigger. And I'll also reflect this when we add a version of trap code form. Let me close out the base geometry and head down to the material section. You'll see that the, there's a surface uh, preset called smooth surface here, but I could change this to something like a preset like gold to decorate and color the surface of this. But some of my favorites actually happen to be to create this sort of wireframed look of this particle system. Just by scratch, I'll actually choose uh, the wireframe default. And just to show kind of moving it around how this looks. Not to mention I could play with uh, things such as reflectivity, which is by default referencing something here in this reflection section. It's this desert horizon lighting. I could choose from a preset, or you'll see here at the very bottom, your ability to reference a custom environment map if you brought this in. So this could be a way to sort of stylize this simply by uh, using a HDR map. And of course, play with the amount of reflectivity that's occurring, not to mention the overall opacity of this. But just a great way to, to set up sort of a base geometry, somewhat abstract, using trap code mirror. So let's add to this. There was a, two layers of form that existed on top of this mirror in my final example. How I'll get there, let's create a solid. I'll call the first one here form. I'll lower my form layer. And under the effect menu, let's go here by default into trap code, get our first instance of form. I will solo it so we can take a look. And you'll see by default form right now has a series of sphere particles mapped to a box grid. To double check that, you can head to your base form section, looking at the box grid, seeing that there are three box grid particles separated in Z space. And of course, this is not what we want. We want it to reference an OBJ. So 
like mirror uh, under the base form or your option, the base geometry that's in mirror, there's the option here for an OBJ model. And we can see a little parallel here to choose an OBJ. Look at these form based presets, the Pixel Lab presets. And I've already loaded up here the custom amplifier OBJ from Cinema 4D by adding a new object. I'll just choose this as the base. And voila, within a few seconds, we should see that it loads up the um, geometry here. Now, there are some additional options we have when we're using form, and that appears under OBJ settings. First of all, these particles are being mapped to the edges of my OBJ model, but I could choose from vertices, very different design there, faces, as well as volume, and you'll notice that it kind of blows out by default here after it calculates the entire particle system here. But there's a little option for particle density. I'll bring this to 15%, which will make that volume a lot less dense. So we can see these little intricate particles here being wrapped around our OBJ and just sticking to them. If we did this in particular, they would be flying off the surface because they're being emitted. Now back to the coordinate system, I'm gonna turn back on mirror. You'll remember earlier that under the geometry section, I scaled this up and repositioned it in Z space. I'll do the same thing in form, scale it up to 700 and position it 300 pixels forward. In fact, I'll position it 400 pixels forward so we can kind of see its outline uh, just in the forefront of our mirror object but you can see there that they share the same coordinate systems. Awesome. Now, by default, I was mentioning that the particles that are being referenced are spheres. You've got these choices for a variety of presets, but what I'd prefer to do is kind of reference my own shape layers uh, that I'm going to create using a, a third-party tool, which I think is fantastic. Um, but the whole idea, and the way that I'm gonna get it referenced inside a form is by using or having it referenced as a sprite. I'm gonna choose colorize so that I can decorate it with a specific color. You should note that just like base OBJ objects that you can choose from as your base form, you can choose from a series of preset sprite particles. This is, an entire library of PNG files, not to mention other files that try to, in some cases, mimic as if they have volume. But all of this is available to you inside of Trapcode Forum. You could select one of these and they would be mapped to your particle system. So let me just select here at the top a locator this time, choose OK. You should see in a few seconds that now this particle system is referencing that sprite. I uh, can't quite see it so clearly because these particles are small, but let me just use a little bit of Z scale here to zoom in on this object and maybe upping the quality here temporarily to auto. Uh, you should see that all of those items, those PNG files are being referenced. Cool. So let me undo that uh, move I did with my camera. And let's just change the type of sprite being referenced to our own custom that we'll have existing inside our After Effects composition. So there happens to be, I'll just turn off near temporarily here, a plugin available from AE Scripts. The plugin is called Layer Generators. And what's awesome about it is inside that plugin, there are three tools, but one of them is called vector icons. And I find that this is so useful for trap code form in particular. What it does is gives you access to a bunch of icon sets from Google, type icons, foundation, etc. And you can do searches. So let me go to Google material design. And I'll search for the word music because I'm looking for music PNG files to kind of map over here. And you'll see that five, uh, four come up. Um, library music, music video, cue music, music note. Since they are meant to be referenced by a particle system, 
I will make sure that this is set to fairly small, 48 pixels. And if I click the Create button, notice that in my After Effects composition, I have now four shape layers, all 48 pixels each. And this is awesome because this can be referenced by particular. So, sorry, by form. So how do we do that? Uh, one way is to kind of create an image sequence. And I'll do this rather quickly by selecting these layers and creating a pre-comp. I'll call this pre-comp music. And with this composition now open, I'll do a few things to have each of these shape layers be one frame after the other. First thing I'll do is select them and trim them to be all one frame in length by pressing Option right square bracket. Then using the animation menu, I'll use my keyframe assistant and sequence them here in time. I have one other housekeeping thing to do, which is keep in mind that each of these elements are 48 pixels. So to not blow up particular and, and form, I will take my composition settings and make it the exact size of those shapes. So you can see there each of my uh, shape layers. And I'll just make sure I'm on the last frame there and trim my composition size to be just four frames long. Oh, let's try that again. Awesome. So this is all set up now for form. We've got this really small image sequence. And if I take my form layer, I go here to the texture section. This is where I can reference that music pre-composition and make sure that it's referencing as a random still frame, each one of these. You might be able to see if I zoom in here on the composition, some music icons already taking up that shape, which is just awesome. And having uh, vector icons kind of do this for you, uh, super cost efficient plugin, by the way, if you check out AE scripts, I think Simon, you have a link for that as well. Uh, just a great tool to sort of decorate your uh, form-based system. So that's exactly what I did here. I then followed that up with a little bit of colorization uh, and under the particle, by default, each of these form particles are given a solid color. But I'm going to change that to have the color change over the X axis. And this is currently being colored by this color over parameter and this randomize this gradient that is multicolored. One of my favorite things to do is click on this randomization button to get various color patterns. Uh, by the way, you can choose from a series of presets here, and there are even more presets for these colors inside of the form designer. So once you find one that you like, you can make a few changes to it, and then use that as your reference to decorate your particle system. Cool. So we've got this. Uh, form base here uh, being decorated by our music symbols. I'm actually going to take this and duplicate that form layer. I'm going to solo this out. And going back to the base form on that duplicate form layer, I'll change the OBJ settings of this to be just the edges. So I just have a lot less particles. Give it a second to calculate. Now we can see a little bit of a slightly different design um, happening there. Maybe even bring down the density a bit more as well. Whilst you're doing this, Nick, we had a great question from Brad, was asking essentially what the difference is between mirror and form and why would you use one over the other? Great question. Um, and I like to think of form as a way of, first of all, mapping particles to a surface and not having them be projected from that surface. So that, that explains kind of a difference between that and particular. So particular is an emitter-based effect where particles are emitted from the surface by some sort of force. They also have a life and death span. With form, um, particles are mapped 
to a surface of your choice. So whether that be an OBJ model, a box grid, a sphere, et cetera. And you can use certain sections of form uh, to have these particles either drift off the surface or have them oscillate on the surface itself. Mir is not really, um, it's, it by default isn't like, wasn't really meant to be used for um, mapping particles to it. So Mir can actually be used as a plugin just to have a 3D, a 3D OBJ model in your scene, which you can texturize, use various surfaces and colorize it um, using that plugin. Just a great way of bringing in a 3D OBJ model. And you can actually in various ways bring in materials to decorate it. It's not necessarily meant as a plugin uh, to map particles to that OBJ surface. The other thing about Mir that I have to add is it's a great thing for these sort of fractal based landscapes. That was its primary tool was to create incredibly um, long and abstract landscapes that you could bring inside your After Effects project. Did you have anything to add to this, Simon? No, that that's a pretty good explanation, actually. I just added into the notes a quick little one of the 20 second tutorials about um, how you might use Mir with a texture and a reflection map, as well as fast ways of getting stuff into After Effects without having to wait for it to render. Awesome. Yeah, so um, for this type of look, you know, even there's even wireframe presets that you could use form for, but this is a great way to now have particles kind of move around the surface. And I, I wanna show one more thing. I know I'm running short on time, but it has to do under a form with having these particles respond to audio. So there happens to be inside a form an audio react section. And I wanna let you know, I already have an audio file inside this composition. I'll press LL to reveal its waveforms. So you can see there, uh, and I basically want form to respond to a specific frequency inside this audio track. The first thing to do under the audio rack section is to identify where your audio is. The next thing to do is to choose something or a particular parameter inside of form to react. Uh, one of the simplest to get up and running with is particle size. We should see that even when I have this selected um, and I move a little bit forward here, that these particles, I don't know if you saw that, are actually growing in size. And that's because of the 100 hertz frequency that it's currently um, using as the driving force to change the size of these particles, to react to that audio. We can change the strength. So I could do something like 200. Uh, and of course, these particles are gonna grow even more in size based on that audio hit. You can see that they're much larger. Well, the cool whole idea behind this is that you can map a parameter to be affected by audio and then choose a frequency and a threshold to control how that um, item that's being affected, that parameter that's being affected, responds to a certain audio cue. And that's kind of how it ended up here with just a simple size adjustment there with the audio being affected to the lower um, frequencies from the audio track. Pretty amazing and neat. And some of the best examples I've seen of this real world workflows and stuff that I've done as well is uh, doing this rather subtly, but can add so much more life to your form particle system. And those were the, the kind of two examples that I wanted to um, share, three examples, during our first little hour here together. And I think that there is a link or there will be a link to the these project files minus the music in this particular example for if you wanted to have access to it too. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll um, follow up with some links for that as well. Yes. So that kind of brings me to the end. I know that we're at 12.58, 12.59 here. And Simon, I just wanted to thank you again for having me. 
we'll be covering even dive deeper into these kind of workflows in Red Giant Complete tomorrow, looking a little bit more at form, uh, not to mention Red Giant Universe, which is just this incredible uh, large collection of effects uh, that you can use as motion graphic designers um, and use in conjunction with material from Cinema 4D from Maxon. And uh, just to mention, if you guys are looking for more information about me online, I have a ton of courses on, on LinkedIn Learning. And then my other site uh, is uh, called Creative 111. And uh, if you- Nick, do you want to pass over the control of the screen to me and I can show your site? I've got it up and ready to I go. Could, I could do that for you, Simon. Oh, you could do it as well. You have access to the I internet. Could, I could you do know it. How to do it. I could, I'm changing presenter here. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> um, right. Pass back over to you, my friend. Um, and there's, uh, there's my website. Uh, we offer kind of training in terms of After Effects as well as video editing. This uh, first course that you're looking at here happens to be from my um, business partner, Ian Robinson, kind of take you through Photoshop 3D workflows uh, inside of After Effects. And that footage uh, was from a, um, a feature film that I edited called My Father and the Man in Black. So it uh, uh, features Johnny Cash material. Excellent stuff. Oh. The, um, the other thing I was gonna say is that um, what we'll do is we'll reference some we'll reference the project files that Nick mentioned in the next sessions that we're doing tomorrow and Thursday as well and yes. so we'll give a reminder to everyone um, so we'll uh, please feel free to use that PDF that we've got inside the webinar link here it's the one in the handout section so called workflows for MoGraph designers PDF and that's got the clickable links to actually register for all the future sessions. And also, if you missed any of the previous sessions, you can click on that link and that acts as a link to the recording. Um, there's um, a couple of shout outs. Hello to, um, hello from Warsaw. Thank you. That's great. We got hello. a number of people from different locations. Um, so awesome. Visiting in. Um, Drake's come up with an interesting question, which is um, essentially, that there have previously been lots of different versions of cinema, things like Studio and Prime, and those have been condensed into the, the new releases like R20 and R21. And also had a comment about the difference between Mir and Form and um, Particular, and having them set as different tools versus how they might be integrated perhaps in the future. And also that relates to another question we had about, are there plans to use Particular together with X Particles and Cinema? Oh, and that was Jesus who asked that question. So the um, oh, X Particles is made by our friends at Intidium, so they make that as a plugin for cinema. But certainly now that Red Giant and that uh, Maxon have merged, it's very exciting because we've got the two engineering teams talking directly together now. So the the short non-committal answer to the both of those questions is wouldn't it be interesting if both the um, engineering teams working together found a way to actually make nice routines and workflows that actually connected everything that that would be a fun comment wouldn't it so <laughs> joking aside that's that is what we're looking at the um we've had lots of feature requests to take um what dick has been showing today about practical ways of integrating the different tool sets and actually perhaps making them um, more connected technically. So um, yes, we're looking at that, absolutely. But if you've got any specific workflows that you quite like to look at, then please let us know. Because there, there's an easy link if you wanted to let me know, simon at redgiant.com. And that's for all the Maxon tools as well, because I'm the director of training for both companies. And then we'll gladly take on both feature requests for the products. And also, if you'd like to have any more topics for these training sessions, we'd love to do them. Um, just thanks from everybody. Thanks, Larry, Brad, Nick, Kurt, Jonas, as well, for all your nice comments at the, um, at the yeah. end of this session. You learned lots. Thanks, Pedro. This is great. Awesome. Um, That's great and to hear, man. Also questions about um, trap code and After Effects and Cineware and working with different files and transferring between the two. That that was from Larry. Yes, we're looking at those sorts of things as well. So there's, it's uh, it's an exciting time. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, Matthew says, great presentation, Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> so, it's, this is a wonderful opportunity for us, certainly for me, to look inside Nick's brain and see how he, um, a, 
approaches the creative process. So I think it, it's wonderful to be able to use those techniques that just save time so you can have extra iterations of the designs. It's fantastic. So thank you again, Nick. Thank you, Simon, for having me again. This is exciting. You're, you're, most, well, you're most welcome. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for all the, the nice comments. Uh, please join us for the other sessions. And please feel free yes. to register. And of course, we have more of these coming in the next few weeks. So that, um, keep an eye out in your inbox for, for more. And if you'd like to book Nick for a custom session for your team, please do as well, because um, part of the volume program we've operated at Red Giant, which we've now extended to all the, the Maxon tools as well, is the ability to have these complimentary training sessions for your team, customized and working for your workflows. So if you've got questions about that, yeah. please let me know. And if you're working from home and you need to access licenses that typically you only have access to at work, let us know because we've got methods to be able to let you work remotely too. So again, please please contact me if um, there are any, any things that you need to make that work because I know that we've got lots of different remote workflows going on in these times and a lot of people working from home too. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. So great. Okay. We'll see you tomorrow on the next one of these. Apologies for going five minutes over. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with us. There's just so, much, so much to guys. squeeze into these times. It's, I know. it's, it's so funny how it goes so quickly. <laughs> so, so fast. Exactly. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Stay in touch and we'll see you on the next one tomorrow. All right. Take care, everyone. Stay Bye. well. All right. Bye.